there's no limit. I mean, these chemists are very smart. They're very creative um, and they just experiment. And I think there's a lot of dead people in the part of that experiment. They just work their, you know, it's like a bad episode of Breaking Bad, but it truly is making that blue meth that was highlighted in that television series. And one thing I like about that series is it, it, it showed the chemistry involved. It kind of went in depth a little bit to the concept of you don't need to be you know, some mad PhD scientist out of like the Stanford think tank or, you know, some bio lab. These are Mexican. These are Chinese. These are cartel gangster chemists that have a little bit of base knowledge and they're creative. So they will continue to experiment and they'll find something that will make them more money with no concern for life or humanity. And that is going to get people addicted quicker so they can sell more product. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually it could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Change Agents, an Ironclad original proudly presented by Montana Knife Company. Today, we're going to be talking about something that is very close to home for me. And I mean that literally and figuratively. We are going to be discussing how cartels are infiltrating the state of Montana. Joining us on today's show is return guest John Norris. If you have followed the podcast, the first time that we spoke mostly was about his time as a game warden and his activities, specifically counter narcotics operations in the state of California. He is the author of the book Hidden War, How Special Operations Game Wardens Are Reclaiming Wildlands from Drug Cartels, as well as the book War in the Woods, Combating the Marijuana Cartels on America's Public Lands. He served as a game warden for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for more than 25 years. He is the co-host of the Warden's Watch and the Thin Green Line podcast. He also recently testified in the House of Representatives National Resource Committee during their Securing Our Border, Saving Our National Parks oversight hearing to discuss the scope of cartel infiltration in America. You may think that cartels and border issues focus mainly on our southern border. But where I'm sitting right now, I am 60 miles away from our northern border with Canada. And the influence of cartels here is very real. Specifically, cartels can charge up to 20 times more for fentanyl in rural Montana compared to urban areas. And in the last several years, overdose deaths have risen by 49% on Native American reservations. Reservations, of course, are sovereign nations, which complicates enforcement efforts. And in recent years, authorities in Montana have arrested 22 members of a drug trafficking ring tied to the Sinaloa cartel. Well, let's dive in and get to the conversation with John. Well, man, you're uh, so you're in Cali about, well, I was going to say you're about as far away as you can get from Montana, but you're in what would be considered Northern California, even though last time I checked, it's dead center on the map. I don't right. know why people call the Santa Cruz area Northern California. Um, working cartel issues. I want to talk today about their influence in the state that is near and dear to our heart because we live there, Montana. Right, right. Yep. I don't think most people would associate cartel influence uh, with the northern border, I think, and for a long time, myself included, I thought cartel, border issues, everything along our southern border with Mexico. And where I'm sitting right now, you've been in studio with me before, is about 60 miles if you were to go direct to the Canadian border. And all trends are showing that we're seeing an increase in cartels at our northern border. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that and what has changed since the last time that you were on, because you were on uh, last summer. Yeah, brother, you hit it on the head, man. Montana is near and dear to both of us. Obviously, my family has hailed there for 40 years. You settled. It's considered one of the, you know, the last great place in America, you know, a remote state, um, not overpopulated yet. There, there's an opportunity to get out in the wilds, enjoy the, the, the wilderness, you know, everything, the environmental stuff we love has to offer. 
and it, it's oxymoronic to think, hey, man, this, you know, the Sinaloa or Jalisco New Generation cartels are in Montana. What the heck are they doing in Montana? Um, but this is it's just an example of the cartels being embedded and comfortable and operating with impunity everywhere. And now it got the rate, you know, it's on the radar of Montana being such a sensitive area. And that article I sent over to you was sent to me from one of the producers I'm working with on another project. And he said, can this be true? You know, northeastern Montana, these tribal reservations are being inundated with fentanyl and Jalisco New Generation is coming in and taking them over. How is that even possible? Why is it even a problem up there? And it, it is. It's a huge problem. And I think the big question is, well, how are they doing it with impunity? How is it so easy and why are they there? And when you look at the fact that we're so remote in Montana that in the big cities, like where I'm t positioned today temporarily till I get back home where you're at, San Jose Bay Area, fentanyl pill is three to five bucks, right? This stuff's being made by the millions and millions of pills. We know about the hundreds of thousands of deaths nationwide. You and I have talked about it a little bit on your Cleared Hot podcast, but this is one of the one of many cartel polycrimes that is a national epidemic. It is a priority problem that we're not, you know, handling fully. Yeah. And then now, now in those areas, Andy, these are a hundred dollars on the black market. So the cartels realize that they got low level dealers that are kind of selling to reservation tribal members or selling to small town community members. They're sucking them into addiction. They're basically creating a market. Um, and then they're realizing it's so lucrative and Again, because there's no coverage there for law enforcement. Think how remote we are where you and I live in northwestern Montana. Now go to tribal lands five hours east, and I've done a lot of time over there hunting and stuff. And man, it's, as you know, brother, it's no man's land. And um, yeah. when you look at the lack of sheriffs, game wardens, and how spread out they got to be over there working for, you know, the U.S. government, the state of Montana or whatever, let's let's look at tribal police. Let's, let's look at BIA officers. Um, they are... I thought game wardens had it tough. I thought we were really remote and we are, and we cover ridiculous areas alone. Take that times five exponentially for what these BIA, these tribal officers have to deal with. Um, the one one stat I heard for in Montana where that fentanyl problem is, you got two BIA officers, tribal police covering 440,000 acres or more. Dude, that's a lot of country. And that's not like cities paved yeah. roads. They're in a lot of remote, tiny little communities. So these guys are spread out. Um, the cartels know that. So they're going to play to that, just like they did in COVID when we weren't in the woods because we were all on lockdowns. Uh, you know, law enforcement were tied up doing civil unrest. We were doing medical issues, dealing with hospitals, uh, you know, with overcrowding, things like that. So cops that did what I did that are in, in the outdoor rural areas just weren't available to do what we would normally do. And the cartels love that. They thrive on it. So they're going to make big profits. In Montana, in this case, in the area we're talking about, brother, it's even worse. So that's the problem we have to look at. How are we going to attack this thing nationally? And how are we going to now realize that, hey, this is going on in every single state of the union on some level? If it's not a fentanyl problem, we have super meth. And I know that's something that um, I'm starting to see this this poly crime thing going on with these cartels. So Sinaloa, Jalisco, New Generation, the Chinese now trading basically crimes in California now and in many other states. We're starting to see the clandestine weed, the black market weed that's toxically tainted with either Chinese poisons or Mexican carbofuran poisons like we discussed. They're kind of giving the weed over to the Chinese and saying, you guys can run that. But we, we're going to run fentanyl. We run a run meth. That's where our big profits, provided you guys provide the precursor chemicals, Chinese manufactured, and they're in collaboration. And, you know, this is just starting to get the attention I think it needs. And this all started to blow up. In fact, I think you and I talked about it on your Cleared Hot platform first. And right after that, I got invited to go testify in Congress on not only the hidden war issues and the environmental issues that we fought right here at Ground Zero, where you and I came from in California. But now... This isn't just a border issue. And what that congressional committee had me there for, the name of the hearing in the Natural Resources Committee was protect our borders, save our parks. So they were getting right to environmental. They were getting right to protecting national lands. And of that bipartisan committee in Congress, they're focused on the border, the border, the border, these border control bills. The border flooding is out of control. You know, we've got tens of thousands potentially of, you know, terrorist watch list candidates now that have crossed the border and embedded who knows where in, in, in America. We've got a ton of Chinese military age males coming across with Chinese passports from mainland China that are not renegades. These are 
skilled operators going straight into private land weed production for the black market. And now, like we talked about in Cleared Hot, these Chinese chemicals, fungicides, rodenticides, insecticides that are beyond nasty. They definitely are as deadly and poisonous as the carbofurin and metaphos stuff we're seeing the Mexicans bring up from Tijuana. But like we talked about before, they're burning them in smudge pots. They're creating a smoke aroma inside these hoop houses and contaminating everything with this aroma of this deadly neurotoxin and wearing Tyvex hazmat like, you know, fitted breathing masks to put this stuff on. And we don't want our public recreational black market medicinal touching that cannabis for any reason. You know, we have legitimate grower groups in California hearing about this and seeing this up in Northern Cal and going, whoa, 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 whoa. Absolutely time out. That's not what we're about. But unfortunately, that's potent weed and there's a market for it all over the country, especially in the states where there isn't regulation or the regulation has been done a little bit poorly. And now they can go to a black market source and get weed at a third of the price. Very potent in THC content, but incredibly deadly over a long duration because of those poisons. That's all coming across the border. So when we're trying to focus on border control, border control, border control, you know, we need to do that. But we got to remember, this is an embedded national security problem now. We have over 7.3 million illegal migration crossings that have happened since border, basically border policy changed, right? We're, they're here. We have deportable felons all over the U.S. embedded. They're bouncing city to city, state to state. They have criminal histories from Mexico, Honduras, other places, radicalized jihadists from the Middle East. Everybody's getting in that wants to get in. And I don't like to, you know, this isn't like, hey, uh, Andy, let's talk and get everybody fired up on paranoia, but let's just be realist, right? Let's be realist of what we're dealing with in the country and what we need to have from a preparedness standpoint, especially when we go to how are we going to solve this problem. And whatever we do on the border in November, with a, if the administration changes and suddenly that becomes a focus, I mean, I'm praying and crossing my fingers that it does, but whether it does or not, this is happening right now in America, border to border, north to south, where you and I are in on the northern end, southern end, east and west. And we got to tackle this thing as a national priority. Um, and it just gets more and more escalated. And when I spoke with that congressional committee, the overwhelming response when it was Q&A time was like, you know, Lieutenant, we had no idea that there was environmental crime related in the foothills of the Silicon Valley from these poisons that these cartels have been doing for the better part of 20 years. And now they're just operating yeah. with impunity. We didn't know anything about Northern Cal, this fentanyl thing. I mean, we think border, but when you say Silicon Valley, you say Kalispell, Montana, right? It just doesn't equate. And that was my point was to drive that point home. And what I what I also exposed during that is what, ironically, you and I talked about just three weeks before I went to Congress on Cleared Hot was the China connection, the China poisons, the collaboration of the Chinese with the Mexican cartels using America as a middle ground and basically at our expense, our public safety, our environmental destruction, the resources you and I love as conservationists, that's all basically up for grabs. Well, these guys make not millions, brother, but billions of cash dollars that they can launder in America. It doesn't even have to go back to the homeland either side. And they're building their empire for financial domination. They've got a currency control. There's all kinds of, you know, multi-level uh, objectives in doing crime in America, but we're the victim because we're so open right now. So one of many things we got to look at, and we got to look at this as being here right now and you know, not focus so much, hey, let's lock the border up. <laughs> That's a two-pronged argument. We got to do what's internal because it is a problem now. And it, it's, it goes way beyond just border control. Well, that's what, that's leading me as I'm listening to you unpack this, and I think it's it's very rare. I always appreciate the conversations I get to have with people that either a work directly, not I wouldn't say on border policy because most of the people I have talked to are agents that are not involved with ICE. They're more on the enforcement end of the policies that they have no hand creating. Right. But then you know when what you're talking about is this influx of people. So as a thought experiment, let's say, and I know that this is impossible, that. Uh, Border policy does shift. It call it we'll call it the beginning of 2025. And even though it's impossible, let's say it's like a spigot and we can turn it off. How long do you think it would actually take though to deal with the problem that is already here? Let alone you know the spigot being turned off. Again, hypothetical, not actually possible. And I do believe we should have a legal immigration process, right? I'm not Absolutely. saying we should shut that down Absolutely. at all. But let's say we shut down the influx. How long do you think, or is it even truly possible 
to actually wrap our hands around the potential issue that we already have here? And if we were able to do so, how long do you think, in your opinion, it would take to actually handle that? That's a great question, man. And I would say if we stop stop the spigot right now and got a great administration <clears throat> with good policy ideas and made that a national priority. We're going to control the border. We're going to do legitimate immigration in a controlled manner. We're going to get people here from a melting pot that want to chase the American dream. Hey, America is a melting pot and it's the greatest thing that needs to continue. And that's why we are what we are, but we're not talking about that, right? It's apples and oranges. How are we going to stop the criminality? How are we going to stop that? And even if we made it a national priority and through every resource we have at it, whether it's education, law enforcement, working with Mexico, working with other countries, we're talking years, man. We're talking years because 7.3 million people, that's a heck of a hit. And even if 10% or less of that 7.3 million have any criminality in them, are cartel related or uh, uh, you know associates involved in some way, um, active jihadists, whatever the case may be, we're still talking about hundreds of thousands of individuals that are very dangerous in this country. And you know from your operational career, and I know from mine, rounding those people up that have made a lifetime career of hiding in plain sight, it's not an easy- Good luck with that. It's fucking crazy. It's not an easy thing to do. And do we really have the resources between local, state, and federal LE in the country right now, especially with everything we're dealing with, with the unrest, the defund the police push, which fortunately we're, we're starting to see a backlash because obviously that don't work. Um, it's going to take a lot of years. It's going to take a lot of years. And my thing is, is pushing like our mutual friends in this type of realm push preparedness and education. I mean, I think we all need to be aware, no matter how uncomfortable this story is. And I got this a lot in Congress. And I know you and I have talked about this, the whole hidden war concept of the weed cartels and what it's morphed into of being a national problem outside of weed. Weed is just one small part yeah. of this polycrime. Human trafficking, right, brother? Child sex trafficking, which the Sound of Freedom movie fortunately made it so visceral for the general public to go, oh my God, that's really, really a horrendous problem. That's evil incarnate, you know, and the US is the biggest consumer of that heinous activity. So the cartels are involved in that various Mexican cartels and other foreign cartels. So anything to make a buck at the expense, they're going to do. And until we, um, everybody gets a, a level of preparedness to understand what the problem really is, and enough voters push for that being a priority and not just money, but education on what to look for in a trafficking scenario if you're you're walking home with or without your child or your child's walking home alone from school or however they're, they're moving around. Um, you and I talked about the fentanyl pills. Uh, one prescription opioid lookalike is a deadly pill. How do we educate our kids on not to take that for a painkiller because they think it came out of you know a, a legitimate prescribed painkiller bottle and not necessarily to experiment with drugs or get high at a party, but hey, a very driven athlete. And I have a valedictorian level one here in the Silicon Valley of uh, a daughter of a very close relative valedictorian. This happened a year ago. She was a volleyball scholarship. She was in multiple sports, had, you know, a strained knee, ended up getting one of those dirty fentanyl pills in the Silicon Valley in an affluent commu uh, community by mistake, went into her bedroom that night to study with a knee ache, had taken that pill from a friend earlier at school after practice, and she didn't wake up the next morning and mom couldn't wake her up. So that's, that's, a, that's everywhere, man. If it's, on Indian tribal reservations that we're seeing not far from where you and I at Montana, and we're seeing it, you know, in the affluent Silicon Valley and a valedictorian girl that had a great future ahead of her in a college scholarship ready to rock. That's a problem. And I think everybody can relate to that. So we got to educate. And you brought up some great points on Cleared Hot when we were saying, you know, do we have test kits for our kids? And like, not we're, we're not sanctioning it, but are we saying, hey, if you're going to go there, I'm dad. You know, I'm uncle, I'm granddad, I'm mom. You may not listen to me when you're with your friends. Be sure you're smart. Don't touch it. But, you know, where do you go with that? Um, but these are real questions we have to ask. And you brought that up beautifully. And, you know, and we had a pretty good discussion on it. And I've actually thought a lot about that discussion since we last talked, because we, we can't attack it as operators, man. We can't just go plug in the hole on the dam of the leaky, crappy dam. We can't play whack-a-mole. We need to change it from internal Kids need to know what to do. They need to be trained. Adults need to be trained. And it, it it just has to be a comprehensive thing. And I think when we handle it, like some of the money we're throwing at these proxy wars around the globe, 
the billions of dollars going overseas for those type of operations when the biggest domestic eco-terrorist war we're having is right here in America. And that's not an exaggeration. Let's put that funding there. <laughs> you know, let's put that on the top five list. And that's all I keep pushing with the hidden war message. Is this thing just keeps getting worse and worse as the cartels get more embedded and they get more um, incentivized because of bad policy. And it's got to stop. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more fired up to introduce the presenting sponsor for season two of Change Agents, Montana Knife Company, founded by somebody that I feel very fortunate to call a personal friend, Master Bladesmith, Josh Smith. Not only a Master Bladesmith, but the youngest Master Bladesmith and one of the most experienced in the world. Montana Knife Company blades are some of the finest that I've ever been able to get my hands on. They are the sharpest knife out of the box, and they're some of the easiest to resharpen when you dull the blade. I take them everywhere that I go. I have them in every vehicle that I own and every backpack that I ever take into the backcountry. Specifically, my favorite blade of theirs is the Speedgo. It's lightweight, but so incredibly capable. I never leave home without it. If you're familiar with Montana Knife Company, you know it is often very difficult to get one of their blades because they sell out within minutes of being released. What you should be able to find in stock are the Blackfoot 2.0, Speed Goat, or a Stonewall Skinner. And if you use the code CHANGEAGENTS10, that's going to net you 10% off of your first order. Again, my personal favorite blade is the Speed Goat. If they have them in stock right now, don't mess around. Put it in your cart and complete the checkout. Montana Knife Company, they build working knives for working people. And like I said at the beginning, I could not be more proud to collaborate with them on Change Agents Season 2. This week on Borderland, an ironclad original, Vince talks with two asylum seekers about the economic and social collapse in Venezuela that has triggered one of the biggest migrant crises in the world. I feel that everything that I knew, the Venezuelan only that I grew up with, how that deteriorated over time, it completely destroyed my future, it completely destroyed my family. The notion of, of a family, the notion of what you have, it was absolutely destroyed. In, I think, less than a generation. The moment I came to the U.S., I knew the person I was was left back in Venezuela, and I basically was reborn. New episodes drop every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts, and on YouTube at This Is Ironclad. Yeah, the number of conversations I've had recently with parents, because we all, you know, the idea of being a parent and the reality of being a parent are two very different things. Yeah, uh, we seem to forget that we were the age of our children, and I remember what I was like at that age. And I now owe my parents profuse and very verbose apologies for everything <laughs> that I put them through. Hey, ditto, I'm seconding that. But yeah, you know, you want to pretend that your kids aren't going to fall down those trappings, and I think that's a mistake. Not that I'm an expert on parenting, but you know, drug, sex, alcohol, we're all going to be exposed to that to some degree. And I look at even in public schools, you know, there's a sex education program, and we have contraception available. In most places, easily accessible, purchasable at a drugstore. And I don't have any, I have only conversations and no real solutions that I would be dogmatic towards people. But I have had a lot of conversations recently with parents who are trying to figure out how to manage this danger. Not that having, you know, a, a, a sexual interaction at a young age, of course, could terminate in a pregnancy and a life changing event that could play itself out over many times. Right. But the situation that you described where, a valedictorian takes a pill that she saw, thought was something else, and that is life-changing overnight. Not only for that person, meaning that their life ended, but for the parents and the cascading effects into community yes. for that. I mean, do we have to treat drugs much like sexual education and provide those kits? Because I remember my parents telling mm -hmm. me, you know, alcohol, drugs, sex, you know, don't, you know, don't do these things. You're underage. And they actually never said don't do these things. It was always about open communication, yeah. education. And I don't know how to protect somebody from something that is invisible unless you provide them that mechanism to be sure. Because that, at least the mistakes I have made in my life, and we don't have enough terabytes on my hard drive for me to go through them alphabetically or chronologically, they weren't going to terminate in... Uh, a fatality for myself in a matter of minutes or hours. Right. Um, 
this this issue is is something different. And I don't know, you know, why do we wear body armor, you know, front and back overseas? Because those are the vital organs that we have to protect. How do we provide that for our, our children growing up without? Because again, I also don't want to incentivize their experimentation with this. Agreed. Yeah. And much like we don't want to, I wouldn't want to incentivize for people who are not able to make decisions on their own exploring a, a sexual path uh, without protection. You know, it's it's a tough one as a parent because you you bounce up against: Do I have to accept that my children are going to play and and experiment in this ecosystem like we all did? Should I protect them or bury my head in the sand and pretend like it's not real? It's a very tough spot to be as a parent. Yeah, it's 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 brutal, especially because it's a real threat now. And it's a real threat in our backyard. It's a real threat in the Flathead Valley. It's a real threat up in Lincoln County in the remote part where I'm at. I mean, we have the, you know, fentanyl warning, eight and a half by 11 posters on almost every business in the little towns of Libby and Troy, Eureka. And that just started to blow up. And then the nasal inhaler recovery, you know, um, the quick recovery, if you are exposed and you can get to one of those quickly, that you might be able to reverse that fentanyl reaction and actually survive that. I mean, there may be some damage, but you might actually survive it. Um, I think we have no choice. I mean, at this point, I think you hit it on the head when you breached that question in our last discussion. And I think that's part of the overall solution of... We can't put anybody's head in the sand, not our own, not our kids, not now. This is too dangerous. You said it best. This isn't where, you know, you're going to get a bad strain of weed and maybe get a stomach ache from an edible or something like that. You're going to be sick, you know, for a day and a half, but you're nauseous. You're going to die and you're going to die quick. Yeah. And, and something else that's coming up is look at methamphetamine now. Look at the new super labs in Mexico that are producing this meth that not only are the Mexican cartels throwing all over America along with the fentanyl, but so are the Chinese now. The Chinese are starting to dabble in that. We're starting to see that. LA County just had a raid down there, uh, along with some of the weed trade being taken over on the trade collaboration we just discussed. Um, and when they went to this new P2P-based uh, not ephedrine, not pseudoephedrine, since all of those drugs were regulated many, many years ago, and they've doctored up some some chemistry, and Mexican cartels make really, really good strong meth. And this P2P meth is crazy. Um, you don't have warning signs before overdosing. You just overdose, not quite as drastic as fentanyl, but it's close. Um, it's super addictive. Um, and, and seeing more and more of this collateral with the weed stuff I've fought or my teammates have fought... Uh, it's an isolating type of drug. You know, it's not like, hey, we're going to go get a high because we need an upper. We're going to try some of the, you know, weaker meth that we had when you and I were teenagers. I never would never touch that stuff, but I had a lot of friends that did. You know, I have a lot of guys that have recovered that I grew up with that said, man, that stuff was nasty, you know, but I got it. I got out of it. It didn't harm me beyond belief. I'm still doing okay. But at this point, this P2P stuff, the overdose happens in an instant. You have heart failure, seizure. These people are dead. And it's so isolating. You don't want to party with people when you're on this P2P meth. It's super addictive. You just are paranoid of everybody. You become psychotic. You get dangerous. You get isolated. And you are that, you know, you are like that stereotypical cliche zombie meth guy in a bad movie. But it's true. And the money they're making off that meth now, and our kids are being exposed to that because meth is coming back all over the country. Um, it's all over Central California. It's all over the Midwest. Um, it's all over Montana. I can tell you the meth uh, problem in Lincoln County before I even moved there and resided there. And my, you know, my family's seen it for the better part of 20, 30 years, and it just has continued to stay stable. But this new meth is just like fentanyl over the previous opioids. It's just nasty. And you don't get that warning, like you said, where um, you're going to have a bad reaction, but you might learn from your mistake. You're not going to learn from your mistake. You're going to end up dead or your kids are. So we need, we need, all this needs to be out. We need to talk about it with them and we need to educate the heck and we have to have those countermeasures in place for sure. As you just, I had actually never heard of uh, super meth, of course, doesn't surprise me. And I also find that when things, you know, you're talking about a little bit of a, a stair set system, even when you, the very first conversation we had talking about the illegal grows yeah. in California and the chemicals that would be put on top of it, you know, so there's traditional weed, if you will, in the California sense. And then there is the illegal grow. And it's always this escalating competition. How far, I mean, let's put our Nostradamus hats here. We're in 2024, the early part of 2024. Let's assume that the chemists are not going to stop messing around with these 
chemicals, these baseline chemicals, because I'm sure P2P, whatever the hell that stands for, will be banned at some point in time if they can get access to right. it. How far, how far can they take these things? Like, what do you think this looks like in 10 years? You know, looking at what fentanyl's morphed into, Andy, they can t- there's no limit. There's no limit. I mean, these chemists are very smart. They're very creative. Um, and they just experiment. And I think there's a lot of dead people in the part of that experiment. They just work their, you know, it's like a bad episode of Breaking Bad, but it truly is making that blue meth that was highlighted in that television series. And one thing I like about that series is it it, it showed the chemistry involved. It kind of went in depth a little bit to the concept of you don't need to be you know, some mad PhD scientist out of like the Stanford think tank or, you know, some bio lab. These are Mexican. These are Chinese. These are cartel gangster chemists that have a little bit of base knowledge and they're creative. So they will continue to experiment and they'll find something that will make them more money with no concern for life or humanity. And that is going to get people addicted quicker so they can sell more product. P2P. um, And I think it's Oh man, what does that stand for? It's crazy, but it's poly phenol two propo- uh, propanone is what P2P stands for. That just sounds nasty, whatever it is. I'm not a chemist, I'm a game warden, <laughs> you know. Uh, but given yeah. that, given that you look at what they made super meth into and they made it more addictive and they're making more money from it. Fentanyl is a derivative of old opioids and heroin based organic product. Now it's a you know a chemical concoction and it's multiple exponentially more deadly, as we know, from basic opium or heroin. And now look at the money it's making. So they don't care. So they're going to continue to escalate. And I I think it's pretty boundless. And it really comes down to the demand. And it really comes down to the end user to avoid this stuff, to test it. Um, If it's not pharmaceutical grade as a legitimate FDA painkiller or using an anesthesia or something like that, it, it, it just can't be out there. And the only way we're going to stop it, we're never going to stop it, as you know, because in America and in many other countries, we have addictive societies. We're constantly uh, dealing with addiction. We're dealing with abuse of these substances, whether it's cannabis, whether it's opium, whether it's fentanyl, whether it's meth. We have to start at the ground level with our kids and educate them early. And I, I think you're really onto something by saying, guys, this isn't the old days. These chemists are making super stuff that'll kill you in one fell swoop, one bad pill, one bad, you know, small little rock of of uh, of meth or whatever the case may be. And you got to just be really careful if you're going to experiment or stay away from it altogether. And I always talk, I always go back to, I remember right when we were starting the MET team, man, and we were in the pilot program and a couple of years before Prop 64 came in to play on regulating cannabis and cannabis was now going to be recreational legalized in California. And there were a lot of kids in high school. And I was remember I was up in Fort Bragg doing some work there, cartel work grows. And then I got asked to speak to, it was a high school assembly basically, and come in and talk about all of the things you're seeing in this cannabis problem with these banned poisons. And so, you know, I have a PowerPoint. It's very graphic. I don't hold back. It's dead bears. It's, you know, frothy mouth mountain lions. It's all the wildlife. It's the polluted creeks. It's AKs and punji pits and all the things we fought are canine stabbings. We show how bad the, the group is that make this stuff. And then I show what it does to animals and I show what the pink bottle looks like. And I go, guys, I'm not here in uniform to say, don't do drugs, you know, just say no. We're not doing an 80s campaign. You're going to do what you're going to do. And I just tell them, whatever you do experimentation with weed or, you know, heaven forbid anything else, know exactly what you're getting into, know what the source is, because this stuff that you're seeing these graphic pictures of that disgust you is 80, 90% of the black market nationwide coming from this side of the world, from transnational criminal organizations. This is not a legitimate weed farmer that I can tell you, knowing several tier one regulated cannabis farmers in California, there is deeply devoted to environmental protection as you and I are, Andy. They love wildlife. Some hunt, some don't. But the bottom line is they keep clean water. They make a pure product. uh, They don't put poisons on it. They have it certified. They put a lot of money and time into water conservation and everything else under 11 different plus permits they need from agencies like my old agency. Um, California is a regulatory guru. Uh, You're just basically mind-blowing on what they require these cannabis farmers to do. And when you got legitimate cannabis as as outraged as we are on the enforcement side of that stuff being so demanded 
and so lucrative that cartels now Chinese are getting into it and neurotoxins are on it. And our kids might get to that without even knowing it. That was my point in this assembly. And one of the gals that was the valedictorian of that high school class was very anti-cannabis and had written a paper and used a lot of that information and interviewed me for that. And she told me, she goes, you know what, Lieutenant, after I had a lot of kids that, you know, we're up in Mendo, we're up in the Emerald Triangle. There's a lot of cannabis consumption with all my friends. I don't do it. I've just stayed away from it. But I have 10 or 11 that just said, you know what, I don't need to have the high with that risk. I don't know where this weed's coming from at parties. I don't know where this guy's getting this and you know, what dispensary is it even coming out of a dispensary? No, I, I, I don't know that. But seeing what that stuff is on that visual, that's mind blowing. Look what it did to a 400 pound black bear, just a little teaspoon or a, a droplet of that poison that's on that joint, it's on that bud. So that was hope. That was hope of not telling him to stop. But brother, just saying, hey, guys, just be careful. And what you brought up, like, hey, here's a test kit. If you're going to an even more deadly, you know, a deadly drug like fentanyl or super meth, um, weed's one thing. But now we're escalating to basically what I call just a just basically a death pill. It's a suicide tablet, for lack of a better word, because we know the dirty lab tablets. There's it, You're committing suicide without knowing it. It's just boom. There it is. Um, yeah. But that was hopeful. It was hopeful to see high school kids in the Emerald Triangle that is a cannabis consumptive uh, sanctioned, you know, it's kind of the weed capital within the weed state capital of the world. And that was really, really encouraging. And this was before any of these issues that we're discussing now on these super crimes the cartels are doing. And, and I would not have anticipated what we're discussing now of being that even an issue back then. And that's how much it's morphed in 10 years. And so to your point, it will get exponentially worse. And we just have to make sure people are aware and and limit, we're not going to stop it, but limit that demand as much as possible through that awareness. I think that's the best approach. And then we got to just continue to hammer these cartel groups on penalties, on going after them, you know, effectively, aggressively, whatever we need to do. Um, one of the questions that keeps coming up a lot is, well all these other states, it's regulated now. Why didn't this go away? What's this hidden war? Weed's legal. Well, yeah, it is. But what what is what is regulated done to that under, let's take California's law as an example, and know that Oregon, Colorado, Maine, Oklahoma, all the other states that go for revenue and they water down, you know, illegal cannabis operations, they water down those crimes, the cartels go, oh, this is going to be great. We're going to go to that state. And they take California's example, and the Chinese especially now are setting up in Oklahoma, Michigan, Maine. In fact, I'm, I'm going to be training and, and speaking in four states next month that are now dealing with this problem. And their special ops guys from P Highway Patrol, Fish and Wildlife, they're dealing with these massive contaminated weed farms, largely run by the Asian cartels now, with those, you know, uh, those smudge pot burning aroma weird chemicals. And they're going, dude. I mean, we regulated like two years ago. This was not supposed to be a problem. Now everybody, they're moving in, they're buying land and they're going crazy. I said, well, you know, welcome, welcome to my world in California. You know, I politicked for two years as, as the leader of that MET unit that we formed to every lobbyist, every environmentalist, every lawmaker policy, uh, policy specialist and said, guys, we know it's coming. We're going to regulate. Good. Let's regulate this stuff. Let's do it the right way, but just regulate correctly. Don't take the bite out of the cartels, hammer them reward your legitimate cannabis grower that's doing everything by the numbers. We did just the opposite. We watered down outdoor trespass or private land, outdoor illegal, indoor illegal from a felony to a misdemeanor. And um, you and I have talked about this before, but other states have fallen suit. And what have they done? They've incentivized cartels to come into a, a state and go, all right, I'm going to set up greenhouses, hoop houses. I'm going to grow seven to 20,000 plants and five hoop houses on four properties I'm going to pay cash for. If I do get raided, they're probably going to take my plants, but that's it because it's a misdemeanor. So if I have seven plants or 7,000, it's a misdemeanor. For a juvenile, it's, a, it's an infraction. It's like a seatbelt ticket. Really? And then, you know, we're fighting cartels in the California forests that literally have juvenile apprentice coming up, kind of like an FTO program, if you will, that are 14, 15, 16, and they're getting groomed to do the job. They're getting groomed to carry weapons. They're getting groomed to evade and escape, and they're just good growers. And now these kids are in these grows, and now it's a, a you know, there's a human trafficking element of it because a lot of these Asian grows and now the Mexican grows too have gone mostly to the private land because they don't have to go deep into the national forest. They don't have to hide. 
because they really don't have much deterrence that if they do get raided, they know they're going to get raided, but they probably have 20, 30 other growth sites, Andy, set up in that county, knowing that we they are just outproducing law enforcement and knowing how thin we are on law enforcement resources to handle it. Siskiyou County is an example, Shasta, um, even right here in the tech capital of the world in Santa Clara. I was just at a cattle branding on a ranch that I do a lot of protective work on that I've grown up on um, just the day before yesterday. And there were a bunch of uh, special ops sheriff's guys that were on SWAT, some snipers, some guys that had done met work with them that I hadn't seen in 10 years. It was old homecoming. And I'm going, how's your team doing? They're like, well, we're like two guys and we don't have just a cannabis team and we don't have just a white dope fentanyl team. We do it all. I said, well, how much are you getting? They go, well, we're, we're getting what we can, which read between the lines. They're doing the best they can with what they have. They are completely outnumbered. Uh, so again, uh, the, these cartel groups are going to continue to get by with impunity unless we throw a ton more resources at them. And, and like you and I have discussed, it can't just be a law enforcement operator attack. That's not going to solve the problem. But what we get to from the education and awareness, I think, is a big part of not completely solving it, but at least maybe lessening the impacts and getting more Americans in tune with this is our homeland. Let's treat this as a priority and let's start to see state by state by state have programs, education in schools early on, parental stuff, like you said, with test kits or awareness or having that weird conversation that, you know, the next experimentation may not be just a, a sedate cannabis joint. It could be a fentanyl pill or it could be something laced with P2P super meth. And, you know, your life's over, literally your life's over. So we need to look at it that way for sure. There's a lot of things I like about the Mountain Tough program, but I think primarily what I enjoy is they focus on mental toughness in addition to just the physical toughness. Everything they do is grounded in one purpose, life transformations and being strong between the years in the mind. And there's also a community of 15,000 plus Mountain Tough athletes. So the community is strong, they're supportive, and they're gonna help keep you accountable. So you can train anywhere, you can stream anywhere, you can access guided training and on-demand workouts right from your phone, your tablet, or TV or computer, whatever you're into. And everything you need is in one spot. The Mountain Tough subscription gets you access to all the Mountain Tough programs, new programs, and bonus content. And they have programs for everyone. Those who hit the gym and heavy weights, those who like to work out at home with no gear or minimal gear, and everything in between. Mountain Tough has been the trusted training by the dedicated for years now, including U.S. military special forces and dedicated backcountry hunters. There is no excuse for you to not start today. With Mountain Tough, you can conquer your goals with the ideal program for your lifestyle and schedule. Train with equipment or just your body weight on your phone, tablet, TV, or web browser. Most importantly, they will help you train your mindset so you are always ready for anything that life throws your way. Mountain Tough subscribers get full access to world-class home and gym programs, groundbreaking mental toughness training, self-improvement, prehab and rehab, biomechanical form coaching, stretching and mobility flows, nutrition guidance, challenge workouts, and the global Mountain Tough community. Mountain Tough is offering Change Agents listeners an incredible offer. You're going to get 40% off on the all new Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription with the code CHANGEAGENT. Go to mtntough.com and enter the code CHANGEAGENTS to receive 40% off, a savings of about $100 on your Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription. That is MTN, Mike Tango November Tough.com and enter the code CHANGEAGENTS to save 40%. That is less than 50 cents per day for the best in class physical and mental training. Ladies and gentlemen, Four Branches Bourbon is the only spirits company founded by veterans from the Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force. These veterans collaborated with a Bourbon Hall of Fame master distiller and legend to help them make their smooth but complex blend of four grain and 96 proof bourbon blended and bottled in Bardstown, Kentucky. It is often said that bourbon without a story is just brown water. And this bourbon has a story with over a hundred combined years of military service around the world. At Four Branches, they are not just crafting some of the finest bourbon, but they are reshaping the drinking narrative. Their motto, drink honorably, embodies their ethos of sipping to remember, not to forget. And as veterans, we get to come home while others did not. So if you're going to drink, please drink honorably. 
And don't drink to forget, but let's sip to remember. And if you are going to sip and you like bourbon, this has a very interesting taste. Not that I'm a bourbon connoisseur or expert, but smoother than I thought it would be. I've had some bourbons that about ripped my face off. This was the exact opposite. So please enjoy honorably. If you want to learn more about Four Branches, please check out their story at fourbranches.com and pick up a bottle of their fine bourbon today using the code IRONCLAD10. That is all one word, iron, normal spelling, C-L-A-D-10. You're going to get 10% off. How, you know, I'm thinking about what you're saying and, you know, the law enforcement perspective being undermanned and then thinking about the description you had of the BIA, BIA officers to between, you know, 400,000 acres. It's uh, not a topographical or geographical expert, but that sounds like a really large number to be divided by two. And then you have the complexity of the reservations of which we in Montana, there are quite a few. Yep. They're, they're a sovereign nation. Exactly. How does that actually complicate the issue as well? Uh, that Well, that makes it just a lot tougher because a sovereign nation tribal BIA police, they can't do anything off tribal lands and they can't really deal with people that aren't tribal members. So, And then the flip side of it is like sheriffs, game wardens that work for the state or for the county can't enforce without a memorandum of understanding with the BIA and with those, those tribal police officers. And that has to usually be blessed by the chief of that particular tribe. So until it gets so bad that everybody is going to work together, wants to work together, the cartels go, well, this is great. You know, I go on to reservation land. I go into this small tribe. I go on to, let's say, the Cheyenne tribe in northeastern Montana, and I find out who the low-level dealer is that's getting a few fentanyl pills, some of this super meth from some mid-level dealer that we supplied ultimately because we make it but we're not actually running the operation. And then I go and I find I can make $100 a pill in this little tribal town in the middle of nowhere. There's two BIA cops that are running around, you know, for three, four, 500 square miles. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna ingratiate myself. They send like, they call it an advanced team. It's, it's not really a hard, you know, Sicario violent, you know, um, go to guns type team like we might see in a grow site during harvest time, but it's a group that'll go in and they'll just get to know people. They'll kind of immerse themselves. They won't be make too many waves. They'll usually ingratiate themselves to some of the women that are that are in the town that you know can use a little extra money because obviously we're in a remote area. There might not be a lot of resources there. And they'll start to be that supplier. They'll say, hey, we got a better fentanyl pill, blah, 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 blah. And you know, you collect money for me, you work for me for a while. They start to collect that money, and it's a hundred dollars a pill, not three to five. And pretty soon debts start accumulating. And then the violence starts and a little more intimidation comes in. And now it's like, I'm running this show. You want to keep your family alive. This is what you're going to do. And we're going to take over this town. And they do. And at that point, when they take that town over, they've got so many people strung out on this drug because the word is spreading. You know, you got impoverishment, you got poverty, you know, it's people are having hard times and boom, they're starting to use this drug. And now the cartels are making a ton of money and they leave this, you know, completely addicted wrung out and strung out little township and they just move on to the next one and they take literally a lot of those assets that come from those small towns and uh stacy zinn who was a de agent that did that whole case that that article i sent you a link to it blew my mind that she was an el paso texas de agent right on the border so that was obvious she was working tons of border control stuff dea's you know, forte to be down there with border protection, border patrol and us and Texas troopers. Um, and then she goes to Afghanistan to get into the, you know, illegal poppy farming and the Mideastern transport. And then she goes, and there's drugs in Montana and they're sending me where? They're sending me to like Billings or whatever, Montana. That, what, what am I doing there? You know, like she was punitive or something. And then she got there and saw exactly what it was. And before she retired, what I really liked in researching that case is she dug in so deep and realized how pervasive it was that actual Jalisco New Generation and or Sinaloa cartel members were actually coming up to Montana, bringing stuff across the border, trafficking back and forth to get to an area where they could work with impunity, make a ton of money because of everything we discussed today. No resources, really remote, hardly any BIA officers. They can't enforce strangers coming in, but they can't really call a lot for help for sheriffs, for local jurisdictions outside of the tribe. So the cartel just played in that chaotic, unsupported, remote area, which looking at it now, 
Montana and any of the rural states that are left in the Northwest and the Northeast really are, they're ripe for the picking for these guys because they're going to deal with the same thing. Maybe not as bad as we have it in Montana, because you're right. We have a ton of tribes. We have more, I think, tribal diversity between the Cheyenne. I know the Crow have a ton of history on your side of the hill and on my side of the hill over in Lincoln County, and then the Blackfeet. And there are there are many other tribes, but that's a target now. And when you really get to working hand in hand with our indigenous nations, I go back to again, when we formed up the Met, we had a, an operation, Andy, called Operation Pristine, and it was 31 days long. It was August of 2013. And I remember you and I talked about, we started on, I think, right after the 4th of July weekend, and we were going to go to mid-September. We had a 90-day window when I handpicked my guys to basically prove what the team could do, why it was necessary, and how much of a difference it might make from the standpoint of not only the effectiveness of stopping these growth sites, cleaning them up, taking out the bad plants, restoring waterways, taking out poisons, and basically trying to arrest and get these guys out of circulation, these hardcores. Um, and I remember we were teamed up. We had one military PAVEHAWK team at a Moffett Field, and we had basically the counter drug task force of SF guys like yourself um, and the PJs and the Air Force guys that when they weren't deployed overseas, they were on counter drug based right here in the Bay Area. And we had a, we had a PAVEHAWK and a ground crew and two flight crews teamed up and had that opportunity. So we jumped at it. And so we were going all over the state, doing everything we could, literally no days off for the whole month of August. And in the middle of that, we got a letter request from two tribal nations in California. And I look back on this and I mentioned it a little bit in Hidden War uh, and talked about it because it, it was such an honor. Relations between BIA officers and local law enforcement, state or federal, you know, you always have a little bit of tension, right? Because obviously mm -hmm. we can't enforce like game laws on their place. They can do what they want to do and vice versa. And this was the one time where they said, hey, Northern California, the Trinity River, they called our team. They called administration, said we are underwater with these cartel grows. We think some of our people might be actually on the take to make these cartel grows happen. Um, you know, a couple of our little villages and our little townships, you turn on the water and it's down to a trickle. We literally won't have drinking water because so much water is being sucked dry for this weed. Can your, can your new Met team come in and help us? And I thought, what a great thing for American relations, for one. What a great opportunity. Two, what are we going to see in there? How bad is it going to be? And then we realized how bad it was. And we realized how short staffed they were and how a lot of them did not have the training. They didn't have the experience and they didn't have the resources to go up against an armed cartel contingent like the stories you and I have already shared. But I think what that did is it really, really built bridges. And I thought about this Montana story of how tribal and so many um, non-tribal enforcement agencies are just so overwhelmed that they're not working together. That again goes to the education and the, and the solution. We need to work with our tribal nations nationwide because the cartel is going to target them first. Obviously in this, this Montana example couldn't have come at a better time on a hot button issue of what's happening at the border right now, what everybody's hoping for. I know a lot of us, at least in this conversation, something's got to change in 2020, God willing, we'll see what changes, but Attack it up here, attack it on the southern border as well, and uh, and and make that change and, and just start slowly turning that tide around. And to your point, it won't be overnight. It'll be years and years, but uh, it can't go on indefinitely or I think we'll lose the country. Yeah. What would be your best guess? Let's, let's think about this. You know, precursor chemicals come into a port in southern Mexico. I feel at this point, it's a pretty well-known yeah. piece of evidence that... They're not really hiding it, oftentimes received by, you know, a militant port reception. At some point, the precursors are turned into uh, a dose of fentanyl. Right. What would be your best estimate, the travel that that will call it a pill for ease of describing it, that goes from south of our southern border and makes its way all the way up to one of these tribes in northeastern Montana that is sometimes viewing distance from the northern border, which they're not using Yet. yet, I think yet. that there are probably some, yeah. yeah, yet because of the ease. But what would you say the life of a fentanyl pill? How do you think it goes from birth and makes its way all the way up to a northeastern Montana Cheyenne tribe? Well, one thing about fentanyl is you can get a lot of them made in a cook, right? A million, several million fentanyl pills don't take up that much space. And that's why the cartel's brother have just jumped on this fentanyl trade because 
you get tons of money out of a fentanyl cook. You make the pills are small. It's not like big bundles of weed, right? It's not like cocaine yeah. bricks. They don't weigh anything. They're very easy to hide. So they're made in those dirty labs in Mexico. They're made, you know, sometimes a million, two million pills at a time. And then that stuff's just broken down into certain packages. And that that million fentanyl pills, they're not all going to go to northeastern Montana. They're going to be divvied up just like the weed was and 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 the meth has been in the cartels we've seen both embedded and making the stuff in America and how it gets distributed, but also how the stuff down south of the border gets distributed. The one hiccup is or used to be was getting that stuff across the border because you might have a little interdiction right now, getting getting anything across the border by these cartels. It's it, it's a strategy and a tactic. Flooding the cross points, tying up border protection agents, doing what they're doing, and the cartels basically have a free walk, you know, on on a non you know guarded border, um, and they get their stuff across. It used to be a little harder back in the day when we started this job, but we still were able to get it across. And then it just gets to delineated distribution centers that you know there's a cartel plaza boss somewhere, and there's one in. Southern California. There's one in Northern California. We know there's one up in the Coeur d'Alene area of Idaho. We know there's, you know, these large level plaza bosses that basically oversee certain regions of the country. And they oversee it not only for weed, but they oversee it for a lot of these things, trafficking of humans, fentanyl, meth, cannabis. And then they have their distributors set up and they have a distribution route. And it's just going from person to person to person to get to where it has to go, where they can make the most money. And this particular case on the Montana, uh, the Montana case that was interesting is they were having an actual operative bringing this stuff across the border and driving it all the way himself or jumping different various transportation methods to get up to Montana to start to infiltrate something. So that's very rare from what we've seen. That tells me that the backyard of our home state, brother, was very, very a list on that particular cell with the cartel to send an actual operative that's a distributor and not just funnel it out like a cell so they can stay insulated. I mean, he exposed himself to a lot of risk going that far out and because he's coming from the supply source. So that told me that I'm very alarmed about the Montana impact um, in general. Obviously, um, they don't say it's, uh, you know, the last great part of America for nothing. And I'm not, I'm not trying to bias or disparage any other state, but I think there's a, there's a, they say that about Wyoming, sir, not Montana. Wyoming has a lot of polar bears okay. or Montana. Yeah. Montana has polar bears. Wyoming doesn't have any, it's the last great place. So let's not advocate people rushing. Okay. All right. My bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the best kept secret. I'm anyway. Yeah. Uh, but you know, and, and not to, and, and just look at Montana, go to, yeah, like you said, Wyoming, go to parts of Idaho, go to parts, uh, go to Maine, you know, uh, right now, Maine is one of the most remote, beautiful states, New Hampshire, some of the high mountains there, my co-host for uh, Warden's Watch and the Thin Green Line podcast, um, did his career there. And I didn't even know a lot about that state. I've never been there. And I'm seeing what's there. And I know these cartels are there now. And fentanyl is a major issue. And there you go. And they're, again, making a lot of money in those rural, mountainous, quote unquote, not overblown, city populated, pristine states. And definitely we have it at home. And I'm concerned. And I'm concerned. And I'm glad this was brought up to get a little attention. I was really inter It was really interesting to see when that article dropped, when I shared it, what the comments were and how much it was shared, you know, and I tagged all of our little circle of people that we work with to say, you know, I'm not just saying this is a Montana problem because I love Montana. I'm saying if it's here and they can make it this much of an issue here, it's everywhere. And we know it's everywhere. Yeah. So I think that's the best thing to wake Americans up with that. If we could, again, this is another hypothetical because it's impossible, but I'm just curious to what you think the capabilities of the cartels are. Let's say for whatever reason or capability we develop, we are actually able to hard shut down their ability to move things across the southern border. Awesome. How fast do you think that they could lateral, though? And what do you think their move would be? I think you'd start to see it would just be a shift in method. Um, they're going to find another market some other way. Um, you're going to see more tunnels being built, let's say, if you can't just get across the border. Uh, with We lock the border down. We don't have that flood. We don't have those very easy routes to go in now. Um, panga boats. You know, the panga boat thing was huge up until the border just went to, you know, basically an, an open walkway. Um, panga boats were really, really effective because they're so random and where they're going to where they're going to hit. And with the panga mm -hmm. boat, just so everybody knows, listening, viewing, 
If you don't know, a panga boat is a one-way boat built to leave central Mexico, go around the point, come off the western shoreline of the Pacific Ocean, and basically land somewhere between the San Diego-Mexico border and the Canadian and U.S. border on the Pacific Ocean where they can get into a beach, scuttle a boat, and they can have the first couple panga boats we saw, Andy, we're talking 6,000 pounds of weed. Of tainted weed that was, you know, done in Me basically in Mexico grow operations because they would still continue and they still will continue to produce it down there as well as do it up here because they just need to keep the supply going. Um, that might have lessened now with the Chinese involvement, um, but panga boats are still an issue. And then it was meth was coming up on the panga boats. And then it was just people. Um, I remember during COVID, it was an average of 21 panga boats per month were hitting the Pacific western coast shoreline on the pacific ocean in random places um we interdicted many with allied agencies in monterey point lobo santa cruz we had some down at big sur we had some on the oregon border and you know these things are 250,000 to 500,000 to make they've got all the bells and whistles with the big four stroke motors that are painted to look like the ocean to be undetectable or, or harder to detect um they've got two operators enough fuel they have to refuel maybe once way way off the shore a hundred miles or more out off the San Diego coastline, if they have to refuel at all, they're armed, they got GPS. And as soon as they hit the point that they're going to hit on that GPS, you know, on a no moon or moderate moon night, they've got people waiting to pick them up, to pick up their load. That boat gets just scuttled. It's in the bay leaking oil, doing its thing. Um, I would see that coming back. That's been effective. Kind of like when, you know, the, the, the cocaine cartels were doing the submersibles, the subs. Um, they're going to do anything they can. Uh, the, the tunnels they're building right now are like, they're like major, major product uh, thoroughfares for vehicles now. They're getting big enough to drive trucks through. It's not just a, a little rail car, you know, that they're moving drugs and stuff and people. Um, they're discovering more of those. So there's a lot of money in it. And what we got to remember is these cartel groups, Jalisco New Generation especially, and you look at Sinaloa, and you look at how advanced they are on equipment now, on weaponry, on tactics, um, on vertical integrating their structure with distribution to production, uh, to defending it, to laundering money. They're as good as any corporation in America. They really are. So they're going to pivot to another method unless we put a lot of effort into watching for pangas. We start to make, you know, tunnel detection a major priority. And those things are hard to find. They pop up randomly. Sometimes yeah. we find them. Sometimes we get tipped to them. But they will, they'll just pivot to another method unless we stop it on this side and we just don't demand that anymore. So I don't think we ever completely stop it, uh, but I think we can drastically slow it down. We just got to put the resources there, man. We just got to put the resources there. And we're just not doing that now. Yeah, I would agree with you. All right, Mr. Norris, leave us with some hope. I'm going to give you the final words. We're coming up to the end of our time here. We have basically described a future zombie apocalypse that we're all going to have to fight our way through. Let's uh, let's leave the audience with a little bit of hope. What keeps you in? I mean, you're directly involved in this. What keeps you hopeful and inspired and fired up to still fight this fight? You know, I, I'm very hopeful, Andy, and and I think um, we both share a little bit of optimism because we love our country so much. We're, I think we're very blessed to have – we have an amazing, amazing – even with all the crap going on in the United States right now, just spend a day in Mexico, spend a day overseas in any third world country. I mean, you and I, you and I have both fought for what we really love for our families, for our friends, and I want to see our country thrive. And I do have a lot of hope because I see those of us in the fight still doing it realizing that, hey, we're not, you know, we're not getting it all today. We might not ever get all of it, but every grow site that's clandestine that we take out, every fentanyl lab or every fentanyl seizure we do, every cartel cell that we stop, we know we save a ton of lives. And for me and you, we save a lot of wildlife. We save a lot of wildlife resources, a lot of waterways, a lot of wildlands. That's near and dear to my heart. And, I, and, I, and now that when I realized that the cartels were impacting that, as well as all the public safety things, I said, there's no bigger enemy to me in the world right now because it's in our backyard and it's attacking everything I love. Um, but what I what I like right now is what gives me hope is the awareness and the positive responses I get from far left and far right when they're fully aware of exactly what's going on. It's been very unifying. I, I, I think we talked a little bit about this before. One thing that made the last six years of my career running that unit was going to very 
liberal, let's say, demographic growers or people that were anti-hunters or preservationists, not conservationists, and seeing the damage that these cartels are doing to, say, our wildlife resources, and then the hunters and the conservationists where you and I sit, feeling that same outrage and being unified on that and not fighting with each other on it and finding a common enemy, just like post 9-11 for that that little window. And you you commented on that beautifully. I mean, we had a time, man, after those terrorist attacks in September two, uh, 2001, I was like, man, I feel like everybody's helping each other out. And my neighbors are actually talking to me. When I talk about this issue or we show visceral examples of it, we get a lot of frustration. We get a lot of shock. But one thing we get a lot of is agreement. We get a lot of unity. And that's what gives me hope on this thing. And when it comes to educating kids, I think it's going to bring families together. I don't think it's going to polarize. I think you hit it on the head when you talked about test kits or discussions. At least we're breaching that bubble. you know. And I think that's what's giving me hope. When uh, During congressional testimony, Andy, bipartisan committee, obviously it was a Republican congressman that brought that committee together for that issue. But uh, the bipartisan support as a whole on that issue, when we started talking about the environment and we started getting way north, and now I'm going to use California and now Montana as an example, nobody was, no one was fighting in that committee at that point. The, the, the rivalry going on in Congress that we see daily, and I saw a little bit of it during earlier testimony from previous witnesses that came in. I was the, I was the last of five to testify that day and do Q&A. And if anybody wants to see that testimony in the Q&A, go to my YouTube channel. It's like a 12-minute edit. It's not that long, but it shows you the mindset of this congressional committee. And they were working together. For a moment, I actually saw it. And I went, okay, this is very, very hopeful. And then that same committee got even larger, and they went down with a bunch of senators and, and congressional delegates, both on the Democrat and the Republican side, and they went to the southern border about a month later and started to analyze everything that was going on, what the trafficking levels were, how much stuff was getting in, and I was starting to see like policy-minded people getting outraged that might actually make a change for the better, and that's why I have hope. And a lot of it's because we're doing right what we're doing right here, and I'm incredibly grateful to you and Jack and Montana Knives and Ironclad, you know, for having us together and for you diving in with me on Cleared Hot, man. Um, I think we're a big part of the solution just by educating people. And if we care, other people are going to care too. We just, just got to let them know. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you want to learn more about John and the work he has done or is doing, please visit johnnorris.com. Com. Thank you again for listening to Change Agents, an ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company. We're going to be back next week with an all new episode. See you guys then. Today's episode of Change Agents is brought to you by the Navy SEAL Foundation. And they are special to me for obvious reasons. I have a genetic tie to them through my time in service, and I've actually worked with them on a variety of fundraising and charitable initiatives. Their entire mission is to provide critical support for warriors, veterans, and families of Naval Special Warfare. Fundraising is really hard. It's hard to ask people for money, especially if you are asking them for a check with nothing in return. Um, I wish I could say it would be as easy as pulling on somebody's heartstrings and they reach into their wallet and they give what they can. But oftentimes, people are hesitant to give unless they can see the tangible results of the money or they get something in return. So I'm about to offer you that opportunity. The Navy SEAL Foundation has just launched their winter apparel line and they have everything that you need to stay warm because we're in the winter. So what better than supporting a charity, but also getting something to keep you warm in return. So you can step up your style while you're showing your support. Each purchase directly contributes to honoring Naval Special Warfare and their families. You can visit shop.navysealfoundation.org to grab your gear now.